Well, it happened. We got the second launch of the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy Booster. Once again, this gigantic skyscraper attempted to lift off and perform all of the maneuvers to be able to demonstrate that this idea is going to work. And, you know, things lifted off, things exploded. It was complicated. Uh, we were all entertained though. And so to hash out what happened, I brought in two of my favorite space friends, Scott Manley and Marcus House, and they are a lot more knowledgeable about rockets and space exploration and some of those concepts. And so they were able to help educate me about what I was seeing as I watched rockets take off and explode and uh, sort of what led up to this launch, what challenges SpaceX was looking to solve and what happens next um, as this plays into other missions that are dependent on Starship. All right, here is this analysis from Scott Manley, Marcus House, and me watching the show. All right, well, let's get into it. Hey guys, uh, it's good to have uh, Marcus and Scott back here for round two. We all watched the second test launch of SpaceX Starship Boca Chica. Uh, where were you guys when you watched the launch? Uh, I was at home. <laughs> <laughs> you were at home. Wait, yeah. was, wait, none of us were there, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I was I was sort of streaming. I was on uh, Lab Padre's stream at the time, watching that live. I was on uh, NASA Space Flights an hour before that. So yeah, I was sort of streaming away, just uh, watching with a bunch of people. So yeah, it was yeah, a great, great, I, great I, event. I slept I've been in. asked to come on to the streams, and I m completely misunderstood the times. Yeah, right. so I, I got up at like five minutes to the launch. Like, oh. That's exactly what I did. So I sl I slept in. I'm like, oh, you know, like I always wake up so early. I'll be up an hour before and I'll have my coffee and I'll sit down and I'll watch this, you know, watch the live stream. And it won't be, they won't launch at the first time around. It's going to take them a couple of, you know, there'll be some delays. And so I woke up, you know, I'm like, oh God, it's like the launch time. And I checked my phone and it was like, you know, three minutes to lift off. And they were in like the hole that I'm like, I guess this is how we're watching this launch <laughs> from bed on the phone. Yeah, I know that makes me a... Uh, it's a part a space journalist, but uh, but I watched the launch. I feel okay. And it sort of all went off right on schedule and everything, which, you know, normally there's sort of a few little delays that sort of occur and things like that, but they really just had that 20-minute launch window in this occasion. Yeah. So it was kind of all all in for that one time. And, uh, yeah. Right. Their launch window was an hour long, but once they'd yeah. reached the fuel, they, yeah. they, they couldn't, they had 20 minutes because of, uh, you know, propellant warming. Mm -hmm. all, I'm, all I'm saying is that planning my day, assuming there were going to be delays, that was just, that's the right move when you're ready to watch rocket launches. Like, yeah, you know, they'd never launch on time. And so it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was an insult to me that they launched on time. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, first, Marcus, can you give us some context, you know, how we kind of got here to the launch that we saw this week? Uh, sure. So... Obviously, it's been a pretty big lead up to to this second attempt since uh, what was it, April? Um, and uh, yeah, it it's all been largely focused on this water deluge plate system, which was quite you know there, there was a lot of debate about whether this was going to work properly, whether it would absorb you know and deflect all the energy that it needed to to allow this thing to work. Um, so months after after that uh, started. That all uh, seemed to be get com completed quite nicely, actually, and it all went very rapidly. Like, it was super, I think everybody was surprised by how quickly they installed all that stuff. I mean, granted, they did have a lot of it already sitting by, ready to go, and there was the whole debate back in April, you know, shouldn't they have just installed this thing before launching Are it we first? need this thing? Yeah, that's right, but... Um, nah. You know, right, right up until that point, uh, then they sort of said, yep, yeah, well, we're ready to fly. They then submitted all the paperwork that was needed, uh, Various people got frustrated that the uh, regulatory approvals were taking a while, but in reality, it was actually very fast, in my opinion. It was, you know, five, six weeks, something like that total, uh, which is pretty damn good for any government agency, I think. Um, maybe things got prioritised, I don't know. But um, it's uh, it was certainly wonderful to see that event sort of kicking down the line, and before we knew it, we were there ready to watch this thing fly again. So, yeah, amazing. And, and Scott, let's talk about the separation system what was the plan there well so the previous launch had this you know, this idea where they would spin things and then release the clamps and they would separate due to centrifugal force but no this time they were going to go with hot staging which is 
The idea that the second stage would light its engines before the first stage stopped firing the engines. And the idea is, by keeping everything under acceleration, you keep the propellant at the bottom of the tanks, and that ensures you've got good fuel flow to your engines. And then by just having the uh, second stage boost off, it means you don't need to have this maneuver with the spin, which loses you speed, and you don't need to shut down the engines. You know, but... The downside is, of course, you're firing rocket engines into your first stage. And while we have done hot staging before on you know, the Soyuz, the Gemini, we haven't done it where we've tried to reuse the booster. And that was a big you know, question mark as to how well that would happen. Because obviously we've seen hot staging where the, the first stage literally disintegrates as soon as you fire rocket engines into it. So... Uh, well, well, when you think of it, it's kind of the same problem, right? Which was that, as you, you know, as you described it, when Super Heavy took off, it created this fire tornado of concrete that spread around the the vicinity, and then they broke. And so they they fixed a way to deal with the actual exhaust gases coming out of the rocket. But then, as you're trying to get Starship separating from the Super Heavy, it's the same challenge. How do you get those exhaust gases out of there without destroying things that are important to you that you want to use again? Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, there's fewer engines on Starship to be certain, but uh, you still have to protect the entire booster below. And it turns out that the protection probably worked, but it was another factor which ended up leading to the destruction of the booster. So, I mean, Marcus, those are the two kind of main things they were working on. What was sort of like some other objectives they were hoping to reach with this launch? Yeah, I mean, the general profile of the mission was very similar to the plan from Flight 1. Um, so, you know, the idea was still to get the Starship to a very close uh, trajectory that would almost be orbit, but not quite, and then that would re-enter back over uh, and re-enter somewhere near Kauai, and that was still the plan. Um, you know, they they intended to just belly, as far as I can see, and this was also the plan from April, you know, they intended to just belly flop the Starship straight into the ocean, not flip and try to splash down with a, um, you know, using the, the engines or anything like that. So, which I think was a little bit surprising, but there's a couple of thoughts on that. One, that maybe they want it to be destroyed thoroughly uh, so that it sinks and isn't sort of floating around for somebody to come and snoop on too much or whatever. That may be one reason why they don't want to do that. But, uh, yeah, that was the plan. Obviously, the other part of the plan was for the booster to come back and land at a targeted... Uh, that would actually fire its engines to uh, have a, a targeted splashdown, um, you know, just off the coast somewhere. So um, that was uh, obviously something we couldn't see either of because we lost both vehicles. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the hot staging thing, as Scott said, that was, that was a huge uh, change to the original plan, and I think... Everybody was really rapt to see it, see the Starship escape that uh, and, and continue on its trajectory, and you know, way, way up to 24,000 kilometers an hour or something, which is almost, you know, it's only got to get another couple of thousand uh, to, to be in a full orbit sort of trajectory. So that was a really great thing to see. And we're still sort of unsure what happened at that point. Uh, obviously, the right, right, right. Well, you're getting ahead of the story. You're, 15%, you're, you know, within 15% yeah. of orbital velocity. Yeah. yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're spoiling the story, Marcus. So, um, <laughs> so, so, Scott, now take us to the launch day. Uh, you know, as I said, they rudely launched the rocket on time. Um, what did, so how did it go? Then, you know, when you were watching the launch, what were you looking for as you were watching it take off? Well, you know, SpaceX promised excitement guaranteed, and I'm going to say excitement delivered. It certainly yeah, was. It was, yeah, well, it, no, it was, it was definitely just sound and fury and some great camera work, although we didn't see any onboard cameras. But the thing that we were most looking for right away was, does the thing lift off on vertically? <laughs> Do we see debris flying everywhere? Right. And how many engines were firing? All right, and so I, let's go through yeah, those I questions. Got, yeah, did, so, did, it, well, did it lift off vertically? It lifted off more vertically than the previous one, probably because all the engines were running. Now, there was a little bit of a pad avoidance maneuver, uh, which was probably by design this time, as opposed to unintentional due to broken engines. There was no debris seen flying around. Uh, there was, Actually, that's not true. There was a couple of small pieces of debris, but it wasn't the veritable rock tornado that uh, cast, you know, destruction 
<laughs> cascading around the the landscape around it. Yes, the the debris from the first launch was was projected at speeds of in excess of four hundred miles per hour based on you know ballistic tr- calculations. Yeah, some people but felt yeah. a little bad to have parked their car too close to the launch site, <laughs> or their cameras. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 cameras. Cameras. I don't think anybody got the close day. anything from the close up cameras. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, what I, I mean, the first thing I tweeted out when the thing got high enough is like, oh, the engines are working. Actually, the first thing I tweeted out was, holy shit balls, it's flying. Fl- <laughs> <laughs> but then it was yeah. like, all the engines are working. And that was a huge good sign because it meant the, this was the first time I think we'd actually seen all the engines on the Starship working. Because yeah. even in the tests, they had engines shutting down, like either not going full duration or not starting up initially. That's right. On yeah, that last so, hot yeah. fire, even they they shut them down earlier than they than the entire duration. Yeah, they just never seem to have the full set uh, running in any of the static fires. And, you know, static fires probably got a few more checks and balances where they may, you know, refuse to start up correctly if there's any sort of anomaly. Whereas in flight, there's probably uh, less of those checks. You know, you really want them all going. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was amazing to see them all all firing there, especially as it lifted off. Just uh, you know. A couple of kilometers downrange, it was just beautiful. It was so smooth. Yeah, I mean, it's, because it's so big, it appears to move more slowly than it actually is. But it is accelerating at a fairly fast clip. And, you know, the thing is, it's, you know, you slam your foot in the accelerator in the car and you go for a few seconds and then you catch up with air drag. This thing just keeps accelerating like that. It doesn't stop. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, began to move downrange, and of course we're looking at the footage. One of the things we did see that was a big question was we, we saw uh, tiles falling off, and that was part of the thermal protection system. So immediately we began thinking, well, if this gets to orbit, it may not actually come back to Earth in one piece. Uh, mm-hmm. The pr- thermal protection system is going to be critical star- to Starship reusability, and the space shuttle, as you know, had a lot of problems with its heat shield, and Starship has to use the same kind of heat shield. It has to use a non-ablative heat shield, and it has to be easy to replace the tiles. So they have these big dinner plate-sized tiles, but they have just consistently have problems with these tiles falling off. Mm-hmm. But as it happens, we didn't get far enough to see that happen. It <laughs> right. continued right, so to climb... Is- <laughs> yeah, through Max Q and then approached hot staging, right? Right. So the Max Q. So I want to stop pa- pausing that Max Q first. Like, like that was impressive that we got to the Max Q. You know, the maximum dynamic pressure. Like this is the point that rockets die, and they got. Yeah, through. yeah, that's it. And, and oh. uh, you know, it, it just screamed through there. It was absolutely fine. They did throttle down, uh, I believe, to a degree, and uh, it just kept on going really smoothly through that. So no issues at all. Um, other than you know, tiles falling off. Other than right. the tiles falling off, yeah, that's right. And there's some great footage of that. Uh, probably the best one I've seen is from Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut, slow-mo footage. You can sort of see just bunches of them uh, sort of coming down all at once. There must have been some quite significant vibration uh, just yeah. at one part because you saw just a bunch of them all come down. So, And of course, sure. we haven't mentioned, I've, we've mi- missed one important thing, that plume, that rocket exhaust like with, with the Mark with Diamonds the, with the Mark the Diamonds, Mark diamonds yeah. going yeah. full on exhibit. I hear you like Mark Diamonds, so I put Mark Diamonds on your <laughs> Mark Diamonds. <laughs> right, right, for that twice Mark Diamond goodness, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the right. really so, cool thing about that was is that, you know, you've got all 33 and they just essentially form one gigantic Mark Diamond set, you know, coming down. It just looks amazing. Yeah. And in some of the footage, you can see the individual Mark Diamonds from the outer in- engines, but then you can see the larger structure as it's compressing down to that, you know, heated shock area. And mm, you can mm. see multiple levels of this uh, in some of the footage. It was just something that I don't think people have really seen Unless, of course, maybe you were watching the N1 rocket, uh, but we didn't get any footage showing that. (laughs) Right, right, right. All right. So, Marcus, take us through the hot staging. Well, the great thing about what we was unsure about was whether they would fire all six engines or whether they would just fire the vacuums first to give it a little bit of distance and then fire up the sea levels. But all of all six 
uh, fired up at once, and they actually, um, you know, they they redirected the uh, inner set. They can gimbal those engines out roughly 15 degrees, I think, so they could um, have those three engines actually tilted out set to, to thrust sort of down, diagonally down the side of it, because in the middle of that hot staging ring, it's just flat. It's a big flat sort of um, plate, and then you've got an angle that comes down. Uh, so they redirected those sea levels out, and uh, that seemed to work really well. And you can sort of, if you look closely at the footage, you can sort of see the the, the spread of those sea levels, and that comes in tightly uh, just a second or two later. It's really amazing to watch that and zoom in. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look and, at yeah. the engine staging, it does light up the vacuum engines for about a second before they light up the core engines. So, And the core engines would be right up against this flat plate, even gimbaled out. But um, yeah. yeah, it was important. Yeah. There was this whole sequence coming up to the uh, hot staging where they have to shut down the engines on the booster as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a sort of elegant ballet of fuel, yeah. manage of fuel management. Very photogenic. Yeah, it was super intricate that shutdown of the booster. You know, as as uh, you know, they they left just the three going in the center uh, at minimal minimal thrust. Um, and uh, but yeah, this it almost looked like a collapsing stay. So all the engines just sequentially sort of come down, shutting down, and uh, and then obviously the um, the starship fires up on top and and off it goes. But yes, and then after that, things start to go a little right, bit yeah. interesting. Yeah, all right. So, so so far everything's winning. This is all just going great. Um, so Scott, crowd is going wild. <laughs> the crowd, the crowd's going. <laughs> we, we were, are you not entertained? All right. So now, Super Heavy does its flip back maneuver, and Scott, how did that go? Well, it begins its flip flip back. It's using the engines to turn itself. And it then begins to, once it's clear, it begins to relight the engines. And we can see in the diagram as the engines come up, but very quickly we see that one engine isn't burning. And then there's a flash and another engine goes out and another. And the engines sequentially fail as they're coming online. And we see, um, you know, flashes of exhaust shooting out in various directions. And eventually the booster just disintegrates. It explodes from the middle and... The, you know, the live stream, they actually call it a rapid unscheduled disassembly. And I think I have a pretty good idea. I have a pretty good theory as to why this happened. But, um, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, by all means. I mean, I think seeing that kind of material, like when you say the engines were burning, I think there's sort of two connotations for that term. And I think right. we're into the second one, that engines yes. are literally on fire now. Yeah, I think there was definitely a bit of both going on there. But... Uh, so during the shutdown, and we, we talk about how the engines were shut down sequentially, one of the reasons why you do that is if you shut them all down at once, then you're closing a lot of valves and you've got a lot of momentum in that propellant and you can damage the plumbing because plumbing and the rocket, you know, the rocket booster itself is basically a fuel tank with a whole bunch of fancy plumbing to get it to all these engines and all these engines have computers and stuff and valves and so... It needs to coordinate all this stuff to not damage the booster. But I think that we look at the velocity that comes from the telemetry during the uh, hot staging. And by looking at the numbers, we can see that as those six engines in the second stage light up, that the acceleration on the first stage goes negative. And if you have the acceleration going negative, that means that from the booster's point of view, it's upside down. And I think what that meant was the propellant in the tanks began to slide forward, began to levitate off the bottom of the tanks. And once those engines then were clear and it fired them up, that propellant fell back down and it would have created like a, a lot of stress, a lot of acceleration, potentially damaging the tanks, bursting pipes. We're not clear about exactly what it is, but I think the fact that the thrust went negative or the acceleration went negative at one point is key to understanding why ultimately the booster started failing and uh, eventually exploded. I mean, I kind of like imagine you have like a tube that's filled with water and then you're, you know, you're, you're shaking it around or fl flipping it up in the air and it's going to have this really kind of weird, dynamic, kind of chaotic motion as the fluid is sloshing around inside this structure. And it's that, but the yeah. size of a skyscraper. Yeah, and there's a famous experiment you can do with like a, bo a glass bottle and about you fill it about, you know, two thirds with water and you, and you hit the top with a hammer 
and it pushes the bottle down quickly, it creates a little vacuum at the bottom because the bottle moves, but the water doesn't. And then the water closes that vacuum very quickly and blows the bottom off the bottle. This is like an experiment you can do wearing safety gloves and glasses. Right, right, right. But it's a very simple demonstration of a fluid Battle hammer supervision. style effect. Yes. Yeah. But it, yeah, it, so, yes. So you're envisioning then that there was like a water hammer. Like when I when I tell the kids for the thousandth time, you know, don't turn the don't turn the water on and off really fast. Um it, that's some water variation hammer. of that. I mean, it could yeah. be set, it, or it could be more akin to just simply a deluge of mass slapping into the bottom very fast. I think SpaceX almost certainly know what happened, and I think this is something that they will be able to solve just by changing their sequencing. Um, if mm, it is mm. the case where the propellant was levitated and then fell back, they don't need to add like header tanks or anything because that won't matter. It'll really be more a case of adjusting, not going to minimum thrust on the first stage. Right. And so just not never going to letting it go. thrust on the second stage. Yeah, never just, letting it go negative. Right. And I think never they just let your didn't... propellant be weightless. Right. Uh, they, they basically probably modeled this. They might have done some calculations, and the calculations didn't actually respect uh, reality. And this is why you do these experiments, although, you know, sometimes it's good to figure it out before you fly. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool, um, uh, you know, diagnostic sort of idea that you have there. And I think I even, well, I did shout that out. Do so you the have video a separate I opinion? I'd have... really be curious um, because obviously well, we're smart people here. Yeah, look, I, I think that's broke. It's certainly a very, it's certainly a very good point because um, you never want to see that go negative. You, when you're talking about. Uh, I think it's roughly 3,400 tons that's in that, uh, the propellant that's in that super heavy booster. And if you had just 5% of that left, which is probably about right, um, you know, that's still 170 tons. So you can imagine 170 tons just push, being pushed forward, floating there for just a second, and then all of a sudden acceleration comes back on and it all slams into the bottom. It's going to do uh, some big damage. So that, that all certainly makes sense to me. There, there is, I believe there's a header tank system in the bot in the center to uh stop some of these sloshing issues and the other thing that it seemed interesting to me that the engines or if you look at the engines that sort of started fire you know flaming out and things they all seem to come from the one side and and it did quite aggressively flip around so i'm thinking that maybe there was also some sloshing going on maybe the engines on <coughs> one side had sort of lost propellant altogether and that sort of thing as well uh, could be a combination of both things, frankly. Um, right. So yeah. I actually looked into that theory. Uh, yeah. And what I did was I matched the rotation of the booster to the order that we saw the engine shut up, uh, shut, you know, start <clears throat> and shut down. And what I figured out was that the axis of failure was more or less within about 15 degrees of the axis of rotation. So it, you would want it to be 90 degrees for it to be a slosh. So I don't. I don't think that's a particular... I mean, it might... There's definitely all sorts of complicated slosh dynamics, but it certainly... Yeah. It would be more likely if they were, like, at perpendicular to each other, the axis of rotation and the axis of mm -hmm. engine failure. Mm -hmm. But then again, yeah. I don't know what the actual plumbing looks like inside this. I know people have looked at the thrust pucks and figured out this a lot better than me. Uh, I'm, I'm a distant observer by many accounts, but... Uh, but... But how does this, this differ from the first stage of the Falcon 9? I mean, you've got nine engines, not 31, 33. Um, <laughs> and it is still having to separate from an upper stage. It's still having to do a kickback and, and be able to land. Is it just mm -hmm. a less complicated system or like... Is there something well, they fully, fundamentally they do different fully shut that. Um, they do fully shut Falcon 9 down, So, um, and, and they'll use the uh, thrust vector control to sort of slowly spin it, and they'll also use that to give it a little bit of momentum to fire back the engines. And I, I, I believe they do have a header tank in the Falcon 9 as well just to avoid some of these sloshing issues to, to refire it up, and they've got that down to an absolute, you know, precise, uh, you know, routine now because it's just flawless every time. Um so I, I, I suspect that it's really just coming down to just iter iterating that um, shutdown sequence. And, you know, the hot staging, obviously, a very new thing that, that people were sceptical about that to a degree anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that it's going to be um, just 
probably a case of just tweaking the shutdown sequence because it did shut down very quickly, maybe a bit too quickly if things started to go into the negatives and maybe the Starship thrust had actually given it that reverse momentum just a little bit uh, too aggressively. Uh, maybe they needed to throttle those centre three engines up just a little bit to avoid that. I'm not sure. Um, it's, yeah. mm-hmm. it's very interesting. Yeah, definitely Sorry, needed Marcus- more separation. Marcus, carry on the journey then. So so we, Super Heavy's gone, but Starship carries on. And and it looked good. Like, I was like, that's it. They're going to make it. They they did it. And Starship yeah. just flew on straight as an arrow. You could see the six rockets going. And then... Yeah, it was, it, was, it was beautiful. And we saw a, f- a few interesting... And the problem was we started to lose the camera feed to a degree. Um, we were watching through pretty thick sort of um, misty kind of cover at that point. But we, you could sort of see just before various little eruptions of, um, of you know, uh, exhaust coming from something. Uh, and all of a sudden there was a much bigger sort of, you know, plume come out. And I don't even know if we all caught it. I When I was, when, when we were watching it live, it wasn't, we wasn't entirely sure what had happened. We saw a bit of a, uh, a plume, which we thought may have just been typical engine shut down. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the the the, the six engines had uh, on the indicator had all turned off. We sort of thought mm, it seemed a little bit early to be cutting off at twenty four thousand, so it didn't seem quite right. But we wasn't sure. But yeah, obviously, uh, it was known fairly quickly that there was some sort of rapid unscheduled disassembly that had gone there on the uh, on the uh, starship as well. Um, but what was more interesting was the aftermath of that that we saw um, a little later, and it was done by Astronomy Live, uh, communicated with Astronomy Live just a, a few times last week. It's just amazing footage. Uh, he was down, uh, I can't quite recall where he was located. Florida he was in Keys the Florida Keys, yeah. yeah. Um, and he actually managed to see a shot of the nose so the whole nose had come off <laughs> and it was just the, the nose fell off. spinning around. The front fell off, wow. that's right. Um, so, he, you know, quite, it was quite clear that's what we were looking at because, you know, you could see enough detail, very, you know, very distant obviously, but you could see enough detail. And there was a plume coming out the back of it as it was sort of spinning around. And we believe that was just the header tanks because there's two header tanks in the nose. We believe that was just, you know, fluid from the header tanks just escaping out there. And I mean that was just amazing. You know that that whole big chunk had re-entered later on uh, down um, somewhere near Puerto Rico, I North think. North of Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah. So mm. uh, so that was kind of the demise of the Starship. We really don't know anything about what had happened. No, did that right. happen before well, it had it? You know, it it kicked its termination system, or was that after? I, I believe that was the flight termination system that left that behind because their requirement of the flight termination system is that it has to safe any of the tanks on the system, right? And break, it doesn't have to break the vehicle up into lots of parts. It just has to safe the system. So make sure you're not dropping huge tanks of explosive stuff onto the ground. And so that's what they did. It, you know, it tore the thing apart. And I think, well, SpaceX, it seems to have, has confirmed that the flight termination system fired. And I believe that it probably fired because it came up short on its orbital velocity. And so the immediately after broke it into little pieces as small as pieces as they thought so that it wouldn't be come down in one big chunk yeah and you would have noticed uh right towards the end of that flight it seemed like liquid oxygen started depleting faster and it's a bit yeah. speculative maybe but I that may math. have been the reason <laughs> yeah yeah i drew the graph so yeah. yeah, I mean, what we see is about one minute before this anomalous early shutdown, there is a plume that appears, and uh, if you do, I did this thing where I took frames from the video and laid them out as a graph, and you can see that around about that time where that plume appears, the oxygen starts depleting faster, and if you take the line that the depletion curve had been following and you extrapolate it down. You kind of get to where uh, it would have had an extra 15, 20 seconds of life, and that would have actually got it to orbital velocity. So, hypothesis is that something fails about a minute before end of the burn, and it's now dumping liquid oxygen out. I don't think this was an engine failure, because what you you can actually see the thrust curve, and the, th- the thrust curve just keeps going up. And then it gets to this moment where it cuts the thrust back to three and a half G for you know structural reasons, 
but it seemed to be that it was just performing the whole time. So maybe there was an engine that was misperforming, or maybe something in the plumbing blew out, maybe an engine damaged something in the plumbing, but I don't think it was just simply an engine failure. Uh, the engine might have contributed, but ultimately, yeah, they depleted their oxygen, they didn't have enough propellant to get to space, uh, the vehicle got through low oxygen notice on the engines, which would have then shut down so that they didn't destroy themselves, and then the spacecraft said, I can't get to orbit, let's destroy myself. <laughs> Right. Uh, I'm yeah. surprised they didn't leave that for longer. But I guess, you know, <laughs> if they had a potential contingency splashdown zone in the middle of the Atlantic, they could have tried to glide it in there with their uh, atmospheric entry. But I guess the flight plan didn't allow that. Mm. And I guess at that point, it's still sort of low enough to get a little drag so that, you know, by destroying it, it is going to make it re enter, the parts of it re enter faster. Uh, yeah, it flew uh, an extra typically. 900 nautical miles, 1,500 kilometers downrange. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I guess the worst scenario for, for SpaceX in that situation is if it was able to get just a little bit faster or one of the engines had have kept firing for just a little bit, it could have been coming down over Africa somewhere. You know, that would be much worse. So, well, yeah. That, yeah, the trajectory uh, yeah. takes it down south of Africa, though. So it, it, mm -hmm. they've, they've got it pretty dialed in to avoid anything. But worst yeah. case would have been... If, say, it didn't have a flight termination system and it did come down near Africa and it's then in an uncontrolled state and it glides and it comes at an angle where it actually glides off yeah, know, to yeah. the side and actually hits land. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why the flight termination system, what the flight termination system was supposed to do, it's supposed to stop the things gliding in a coordinated manner in one direction or another. It wants a sort of you know shotgun of debris rather than something mm. that may make a big graceful turn and, and hit something that's politically sensitive. Mm. Mm. So, and right now we haven't got a, like official analysis from SpaceX on, on any of the issues. This is conjecture both from you guys as well as just sort of the, the entire brain power of the internet working together. Yeah, we've had a couple of this. statements from SpaceX confirming the FTS. The first stage wasn't destroyed by FT for flight termination system. The second stage was. And that's about it. That's the only real information. And the yeah. telemetry. Right. Okay. So then uh, I guess what comes next? So, I mean, because they didn't destroy their launch pad, that feels like a good sign if they want to try and launch other yeah. rockets. So, Marcus, how many, how many more tests, how many more prototypes are lined up and ready to go now? Yeah, well, they've sort of got three that are really getting close. One, one, as far as we know, one booster's ready to go almost in terms of testing. But we're not sure because we haven't been able to see it, but we believe it's got a full set of engines already. So, you know, you've got the 33 there. Uh, we believe that booster 10 is going to be paired with ship 28 and ship 28's, you know, uh, having some final work done on it and things like that as well. So we expect that we're going to see testing of those pretty quickly, like over the next week or two. Um, and we'd see, you know, static fire uh, events happening again uh, and all that sort of thing. So this is really positive because, you know, there was no, you know, huge damage to the power. I mean, so I'm assume, assuming there's small things that they need to fix. We know that the ship quick disconnect arm got a little bit of a twist to it, so they probably need to get up there and tweak some of these things. But there was no damage that was going to cause, you know, a month of, of delays before they could test anything out. And... Um, you know, Musk had gone up and uh, quite quickly after the event and taken photos of the uh, the, the plates for the, for the pad, and, and it was just it just looked flawless to me. Like you know, it, it, there was just no damage at all. I mean, he said as much in the tweet, so that was great confirmation from SpaceX that you know this thing's basically ready to go again as soon as we uh, as soon as we can roll these boosters down and the and the ship down to get tested. So these are great, great, great things compared to what we saw after April. Like, you know, there was destruction everywhere. Um, you know, the, the the tank farm, which is really close, you know, it's much closer than I think we would all like it to be. Um, you know, that got absolutely hammered by debris, all these dents and stuff. And we sort of thought maybe after this flight that they would start um, pulling some of those vertical tanks out and, and replacing them with the horizontal tanks, which we see them preparing for. But they seem, you know, they're already refilling. Uh, you know, it takes hundred, you know, a couple of hundred of these tankers to to refill that. So we've seen loads of them coming in. No methane yet, I don't think, but plenty of oxygen and, and, and nitrogen. So as far as we can see, those tanks are pretty much ready to go. Um, that's a great sign as well. Um, and 
yeah, when it comes down to it, it's really just a matter of them proofing out the next couple of vehicles and, and just tweaking a few things. Uh, Scott, are there any regulatory issues that have been identified yet? Well, I mean, they're going to have to go through a whole mishap report, which, um, you know, because the thing didn't operate exactly as planned, they have to explain why, they have to know the root cause, and they have to uh, inform the FAA as to their conclusions. You know, this isn't the FAA doing the report, it's SpaceX is doing this, and then, but they have to present their homework to the FAA to say, yeah, we figure out what went wrong, and this is how we're going to fix it for the next one. Um, so that could take a few months, but I think they could be, you know, certainly testing in a few weeks, but before the end of the year. But yeah, they're going to have to go through that, um, ha- get the investigation closed, and once that's closed, they can then go for another launch license. And I think, uh, I think most of the blockers from the previous flights uh, have been addressed in this case. The FAA may well, you know, require changes to the flight termination system, but here's the thing: like the FAA's own regulations don't require. As far as I can tell, like something as large as the nose cone got demolished. That may right. change. They might change the regulations out under SpaceX. They're totally would be justified, I think, <laughs> in not wanting something that big to come down in one piece. But there were also the environmental issues, like, you know, the rock tornado caused a lot of damage in the area. So do you think there's going to be environmental issues with this post-launch? Um, SpaceX is going to have to do like a report on the water quality because that was actually one thing that did hold things up. The the rocks, yes, they were bad and they were definitely an issue. But one of the more important things was just the deluge system. They had to verify that it wasn't going to adversely affect the, the wetlands, you know, a sensitive ecological habit. And so SpaceX are going to have to you know, now actually take some measurements. I presume they have taken measurements and submit that and show that well, they'll probably just say, look, it's not that bad. And I'm sure that <laughs> right. Take a drink. fisheries and wildlife will probably agree with them on this case, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, the interesting thing about the, the, the deluge is really you've got a lot more water escaping when they're just doing a test of the deluge system. So, you know, when there's no rocket on it, you've got, you've got all that overflow. And, you know, they're trying to capture a lot of it in the, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, the, ponds that they've got sort of nearby but they're not capturing all of it so really there's a lot more water going out in just those tests and there's been loads of those tests that's what was sort of interesting to me there was a lot of the arguments oh you know this thing will never fly till mid 2024 because it's going to take ages for the it's like man they've already tested the deluge like six seven eight times at this point by itself which is much more uh you know much more water going in than than an actual flight so i don't see why they would hold up one flight for that um, but yeah, when when they're actually firing the booster into this thing, um, I, somebody I think it was in the report they were sort of estimating that over ninety percent of that water is being instantly sort of flashed out to steam and you know sort of escaping yeah, wanted, the area. So yeah, you yeah. wanted to take out the energy. In fact, you know the one of the things they were investigating was all the the dirt, the fine dust that was falling down over uh, South Pad- or South Padre Island, and you know, it turns out that a lot of that was coming from rain that was forming because of the water that was being you know, vaporized in the exhaust. Mm. So, uh, you know, this was all part of the parcel of the whole complex interactions. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that generally the the environmental people will most <laughs> will uh, not have had their worst fears realized. And mm. so uh, they won't be such a, a you know, they, they won't have much to do for the next flight. It's going to be the technological problems of figuring out how to fly this booster and make it not fail in the same way. But And, and so following on to that, like, what do you think is the big, I'd like to hear both of your ideas, like, you know, Scott, what do you think is the big outstanding question mark, question mark, question mark here for this to clearly be the rocket of the future? Uh, well, I think, first of all, they need to make sure the Raptor reliability is good. And this flight definitely showed that, that they had 33 engines firing and six in the second stage. And by the way, by my math, that means that the Raptor engine now has more flight heritage than the F1 engines on the Saturn V, right? Mm, right, (laughs) You have two flights, 33 engines, that's a lot of engines. Mm, right. uh, and fairly long duration. Yeah, they and and they you know need to get through these operational problems. Uh, obviously, we don't know what caused the failure on the second stage. Uh, we don't know if it was damaged during the hot staging. That is entirely plausible that that 
somehow led to something failing. Uh, but it's it's really hard to speculate on that side. But I think the first stage, yeah, it, it is probably something that can be solved just by changing the sequencing and tuning mm. that separation event a little. But do you, I mean, do you think that those like 33 engines working in concert with all of that complicated plumbing, you know, that was a big fundamental design direction that they're going as opposed to a sea dragon one giant bell nozzle (laughs) (laughs) very simple plumbing right and you know do they go to 50 inch a thousand inches like at a certain point the the plumbing to weight ratio (laughs) starts to get a little skewed and do you think that they'll that they'll sort of come out the other end of this or do you think that this might be a dead end yeah yeah um it is. I mean, I suppose to an extent, the great thing is is that you know they can lose a, a handful of them and they can still survive and you know long enough to get through the through the launch process. So you know that's always been the positive for me. But yeah, it's just huge, huge amounts of plumbing to try to keep intact through all that. Right. So philosophically, in the early days of rocket design, the com- engines were pretty dumb and they had to fire. And if they had a problem, they would explode and damage the ones next to them. But nowadays, mm-hmm. the engines are smart. They have sensors and they have their own computers and they can shut themselves down. And mm. so it is actually completely valid to say that there is an advantage in numbers here. Yeah, right? yeah. The, They've the, got colossal you... shielding between them as well. Uh, and, and actually, uh, uh, Zach, uh, CSI Starbase did a video that was quite detailed in this just a day ago or something and really breaks down what how all the shielding got upgraded and things. So they should be able to lose engines, have, have them fully explode, as long as they don't actually take put a hole in the booster, uh, you know, sh- fully explode and uh, everything should stay fairly isolated. So that's a huge, big change over the course of these last couple of boosters, I think. Fraser yeah, but back. it's just not something you could do in, with previous engine designs because they mm. they didn't have the technology. And, and SpaceX, yeah. when, when Falcon 9 came along, I remember there were traditional rocket designers that were criticizing the Falcon 9 as being like taking a Falcon 1 and just putting nine of them together and it was a kid's rocket and a real rocket would have one or two big engines because that's the way you do rockets. Yeah. <laughs> and they were t- trying to build a rocket around this dinky little Merlin engine which had terrible performance, they thought. And it turns out that that was actually a really good philosoph- really good design decision for SpaceX ultimately because first of all, they got a lot of flight time on the Merlins but secondly, they then figured out that they could shut down eight of them and land a rocket on one. Mm, and you can't mm. do that with one big engine. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's all about reusability when it comes down to it. And if you can really intricately adjust the thrust by shutting all these engines down sequentially, it's just beautiful to see. And uh, yeah, it's you can't do it otherwise. You can't be you can't do a reusable rocket with, you know, the Saturn V as an example. You know, unless you're going to run that center one, that you know, <laughs> it was, was way too much thrust. To, <laughs> there were plans to uh, reuse the first stage of the Saturn V. Hiller yeah. went, suggested a helicopter which could capture that under parachute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that would have been epic. Right, but to be clear, like just because going from one engine or two engines to nine actually has real design sense that doesn't automatically say that going from 9 to 33 has more sense mm, there may be mm. that this is like an optimum number based on you know landing performance maybe there is a reason why we should be looking at bigger or more powerful engines but raptor mm, mm. is absolutely pushing the limits like you know they are getting really yeah. high chamber pressures really high pump pressures really high flow rates they are th- these are screamers of engines And I'm sort of concerned. One thing that concerns me is that the full flow stage combustion cycle is really, its big advantage is the high mass flow rates through the pumps and the impellers are supposed to lead to cooler turbine temperatures and therefore more benign environments. But they've just taken that extra margin and said, let's make it higher pressure and more Mm. performance. So any... You know, any idea that they are doing this to get a more reliable, more reusable engine Mm. is sort of tempered by the fact that they are absolutely pushing this thing to the limit right now. And Mm -hmm. there's a. See, the other thing I really want to see, and we've never, and I've I've asked this a number of times, I've never had a reply on it online, um, is what specific impulse they are getting with the engines. Because obviously the full flow stage combustion was supposed to be, you know, sort of superior, superior to any other type of engine. 
but we haven't actually seen ISP and you know to a degree if you sort of map out that trajectory it's like they didn't really have a payload on board Starship so you've got to add another 100 tonnes in a normal flight right another 100 tonnes of Starlink satellites or whatever so this had no payload as far as we know there was no mass simulator in it uh, no block of change. cheese and um yeah, exactly. So it was all and, se- it was all sealed up, right? Yeah, yeah. So the fact that it's still seen, you know, there, as as we said earlier, there's probably been a leak in there which limited how it could get to orbit, how fast it could get to that near orbit trajectory. But it didn't seem to have a lot of margin. Um, so you know, you've still got to add a hundred tons all the way through the flight. It's like, mm, okay, I wonder what the ISP actually is. And, you know, there's probably a lot of dry mass savings that they can. Uh, shear off this whole design as they, because it was obviously very robust, first of all, in the first flight when the entire thing's tumbling in the in the atmosphere. The fact that it held up through that means it's probably over-engineered. Uh, so I would imagine they could probably shave, you know, maybe they can shave 30 tonnes off the whole thing eventually. But, uh, yeah, we, we were sort of talking there with no, uh, no real payload. Um, and, you know, for this to achieve all that it needs to achieve to get to orbit to refill itself um, through other many launches that need to be done just to do a full retanking, uh, yeah, and it needs to do that to do a HLS mission mission to the moon, um, probably in a reasonably high orbit to start with. Is I mean, I think it, it's felt like SpaceX is doing this at their own leisure. They've got their own schedule. They, they're figuring this out as they go. But they got the contract to provide the landing system for the upcoming Artemis missions. And so now the deadline is on. NASA is is going to be ready on track 26, 25, 26, that they're going to be sending Artemis 3 to the moon. And they need a lander. Do you think that, you know, and I've I've heard estimates that you're looking at a, like more than a dozen launches to retank just the one HLS in, in the high teens. In the high teens, yeah. The high so teens. Yeah, there's more the than core. just the yeah. refilling missions too. <clears throat> yeah, you launch the depot, and then the depot mm. is specially set up to be able to store the stuff with you know clothes, with cooling and whatnot, and then you launch all the tankers, and yeah. then when that's full up, then you launch the HLS. It bonds, you know, docks transfers stuff across and flies out to the moon. Look, uh, I was surprised when SpaceX got the contract, uh, but the truth is they were the only ones that actually were putting in enough money and they were the only ones that NASA could afford. And mm. that did put does put NASA in this unfortunate situation. Like the more logical thing would have been for them to actually go with, you know, Blue Origin or something at the time, but they had problems as well. They still have to solve their problems, and it's no guarantee, given Blue Origin's ability to meet schedules, <laughs> that they would have been any more ready if yeah. they had been selected. Yeah, yeah. I just this uh, next year, Blue Origin has a uh, launch window that they have to hit for uh, the Escapade mission. Uh, mm. Otherwise, they've lost their first payload again. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, and right. I'm not sure they've. Yeah, we're not sure if they'll do that. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, I've I've always really loved Starship in terms of being a mass to orbit delivery system, but I, I I've never been hugely sold on the idea of landing that huge thing on the moon as being the primary way of like for cargo. I think that's great for human missions. It seems a little extreme, <laughs> so I would have always thought that it would be great to have like a lander, a separate human lander. That's there, you know. Maybe there's a big HLS delivery system that's taking you know huge masses to the moon. Uh, yeah. yeah, Starship uh, to the Moon would be a better thing for like later Artemis missions, right? When they're you know ideally saying now we need to put some real mass on the Moon. Yeah, but it, yeah. it is interesting that it's sort of changing the way people are thinking about mass to orbit and mass to you know to various mm. tart destinations. Mm-hmm. It's got people thinking at the very least. Yeah, I mean, like when I th- when I sort of go through this mental checklist in my brain, right? You've got to not have your rocket explode. So like there's, you know, several more tests need to happen before that. You've then got to build the lander for the moon. You've got to build the fuel depot in space. You've got to launch the high teens, low 20s numbers of launches, not to mention however many failures are going to happen in that. This has all got to work. You've got to demonstrate that you can. No, keep... they can't have failures. No, right. You you've got to demonstrate that you can keep. They, your... they can't have failures on booster recovery because that destroys your launch site. 
Well, of course, yeah, e. Um, yeah, so you can't have any failures. I, I think I reiterate, you can't have any failures. Um, you've got to demonstrate that you can keep uh, you know, your cryogenic, you know, your fuel in orbit at low temperatures mm. and have it remain stable inside your fuel depot. And then you've got mm -hmm. to be able to fly to the moon. For a significant amount a, of time too. You've got to do a test landing at the moon then you're ready to take humans. And at the same time, I mean, like everyone makes fun of NASA and how slow you need Artemis to do is it all taking. Again. They are barreling towards Artemis 2, what, late 24? And then Artemis 3, 26. Artemis 2, yeah, late 2024, probably. Yeah, and then Artemis 3, 26. 25, 26, like, like we yeah, are just a couple of years away from, yeah, yeah. from these Artemis missions. So, I mean, do you think that, that now HLS is starting to have its, you know, is, is taking up a big chunk of the critical path at this point? I think I, I honestly won't be surprised if Artemis 3 gets turned into something else, mm. like a long-term stay at the gateway or something. Uh, that would be one and no possibility HLS. to yeah. actually have astronauts stay in uh, NRHO. And, you know, they, they push things out and then whichever landing system is ready for Artemis 4 or 5 or whatever gets to go. Yeah, I, I mean, there's if there's a penalty a um, question around the timelines, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, well, I mean, s s yeah, SpaceX needs to deliver what they've got in their contract, which, you know, a lot of their, um, a lot of their refilling systems to me is just so key and and we haven't, you know, nothing to this scale has ever been done before. So not only have you got the the largest rocket to ever fly, and this one was the largest again. It was just a little bit taller than the uh, the previous one because they had the hot stage. Heaviest ring. object to reach space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I across mean, the carbon line. Obviously, by a reached big space. margin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then all these propellant systems, the depot, everything that comes with that is so critical to the entire system moving forward to HLS. I mean, don't get me wrong, Starship can be extremely successful as a rocket just as a mass-to-orbit delivery system, uh, even if it could do nothing else and, and be reusable. That would be a huge win for the entire world. But to get from there to HLS and, and all these refilling systems, that's that's huge. And these refilling systems have never been even attempted at anywhere near this scale. Um, in fact, hardly at all, really. There has, hasn't been a lot of stuff done. Scott, you put a lot of emphasis early on on those heat heat tiles, and I actually talked to a space shuttle uh, astronaut recently about, you know, we all, we all remember Columbia and what happened there, and in fact, there were other missions where there was damage to the to the tiles, and in in some cases, like the gases almost made it through into the orbiter and could have caused that disaster earlier on in the space shuttle launches we saw dinner plate sized heat tiles fall off. If any one, like if one tile falls off, that thing probably doesn't survive re-entry. It's a bad day. I don't day. agree with that. Well, really? I think okay. That, you think you, know, you can I lose a bunch? I think the jury is out on that. Is it because uh, of the stainless the steel be frame? So first of all, or is it because stainless steel has much higher melting point? In fact, the one case you talked about, the space shuttle losing a heat tile, this thing that saved the space shuttle was the fact that on the other side of the aluminium skin was a steel plate that was used for an antenna, and that was actually absorbing the heat. That's what sh saved the shuttle. So steel is a lot better than aluminium, or aluminium, as some of the audience might say. Uh, I think that might make a difference, but also the fact is that sp uh, Starship is a much white, it's a much larger object. So there's this thing called radius of curvature which is critical to measuring the temperature you you know you make an idealized model of a spherical cow flying through the <laughs> atmosphere and the bigger the radius the lower the temperatures what happens is as the radius gets as it gets blunter and blunter you get the stagnation point where the actual heat exit where the shock wave exists gets pushed further and further away from the surface so starship not only is it made of higher temperature materials, it will also have a shock wave, which for large parts of the surface where the tiles are falling off will be further away from the surface. And so that might be enough to make a difference. Finally, the other factor is that on the other side of that is a fuel tank, a propellant tank, which is pretty cold and has a fair amount of thermal mass. So that might also make a difference. But honestly, 
I think the real solution is just not to gamble and figure out how to keep your tiles attached. But I don't think that losing one is automatically a killer just yet. Maybe losing mm-hmm. one in a critical place, such as the uh, shoulder where the hinge, where the flaps are, like if you mm-hmm. lost it there, that's a that's a much sharper area. So it's going to have much greater heat impingement and there's critical machinery that's required to control the attitude of the vehicle during re-entry. So that, that area, you see that they've glued them all on uh, because mm. they are a much more complex geometry. There is also a, sort of an insulation layer underneath those as well. So you've got that and, and that should protect like one falling off here or there because, uh, you know, everything underneath should still hold together reasonably well. But, it, I mean, if you lost a big patch of them in one spot, that is going to be a problem, I'm pretty sure. But, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, um, but yeah, as... Uh, so, so, Marcus, the, you know, we saw that the, the, you know, stage zero got a little bit tweaked. If these things are going to, we can't lose stage zero, as you, as, as you said earlier, Scott. You know, are, are, do you think this thing can hold up for dozens, hundreds of launches? Marcus? Yeah. Um, some of the information in the uh, FAA report, the FWS report, um, sort of suggested that they expect about, you know, you know, 100 pounds to ablate off that steel each time they sort of launch that. And, you know, that remains to be seen because they now need to measure it. But if that's the case and that's spread over a reasonably large area of the plate, it, it's, it could be, you know, hundreds of launches before they would need to, say, switch the steel plate out. I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good outlook if that's the case. Um, so I'm pretty happy with the way that reads. But what about the gantry, right, The one that's holding it? Yeah, look, I, I don't see any reason why that, that shouldn't hold up. Um, we haven't seen any damage to any of these systems at this stage. Um, you know, the, the, the launch table takes a heap of punishment, the actual circular ring table that it's all sitting on before it launches. And, uh, yeah, again, it'll be interesting to see after this flight what we see them replacing, if anything, uh, because, you know, we did see them with that pad avoidance manoeuvre, you do see one side of that orbital launch mount get blasted a little more heavy <laughs> because of the, uh, you know, just the thrust uh, vector coming off there. So it's it's going to be pretty interesting to see. Uh, the actual tower itself, I think, is just so huge and robust. It, it should be perfectly fine, I would think, for hundreds of launches. So some of the more delicate systems like the uh, quick disconnect systems and stuff, they, they, they are what we really need to look a little closer at. So then I guess, I, I mean, Scott, do you... There again. Yeah, I don't know, I'm what back. do you think? Right. So Scott, do you, do you feel like there's any outstanding cool. big issues that are going to prevent this system from working? Or do you think everything is solvable at this point? Well, I mean, they haven't demonstrated capture of the booster. Like, there's this whole idea of Mm. not having any landing legs on either of these vehicles, and they're going to be recovered by landing on the launch mount. And that is something which, on paper, saves a bunch of mass. But in practice, you get one chance to get it wrong, and then your launch mount is potentially down for a very long time. And while they have put these up fairly quickly, that doesn't mean that you can fix these things fairly quickly. And so if you're trying to launch 10 of the high teens and you have one failure, then you have to reset everything and, you know, you're stalled. Hmm. Yeah, and look, interestingly, we're starting to see new tower sections coming to Starbase, so we're actually wondering whether they may start making a second tower, but speculative at this point. So, you know, at least then, you know, while they're repairing one, they can launch another. But, you know, it's, yeah, this is all interesting. And, you know, it's going to be also intriguing to see if they start moving again with the site at the Cape because they've got the Cape Canaveral Tower, which all halted after uh, after April. It's like, okay, we're going to need some pretty serious modification to this system. And I think at that point, NASA had said, okay, enough with that. Actually get the thing to work first, and then you can continue building this thing, <laughs> would be my <laughs> thought. Um, yeah. And so I would be surprised if we don't soon start seeing water deluge plate systems coming into the Cape to, to start uh, building that out. I um, mean, don't get me wrong, they're still not going to allow them to launch from the Cape until they've got this well nailed down, I don't think. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, the reason why they've got this other 
Falcon 9 crew tower at Slick 40 now is is probably so they can have some redundancy. If something happens at this Cape site at 39A where they're building this new Starship tower, at least if something happens there, then they can still launch crew from Slick 40. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, it's all about redundancy at the, at the moment, I think. Scott, any final thoughts? Well, excitement was guaranteed. Excitement was delivered. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, final thoughts is SpaceX is going to have to work incredibly hard, uh, but we already see that they've been pushing out a lot of material. They're going to have to, uh, you know, they're going to have to do their homework, right? <laughs> so that they can launch again. They're going to have to push those margins out, get better performance on all their, uh, everything that they're doing, lower excess mass, more reliability, and yeah, the thing that I'm waiting. To, so the thing that I'm waiting to see, the big unknowns are they need to demonstrate re-entry, and they need to re- demonstrate landing with capture on the towers. And these are big things before you even start to go to the unknowns, such as propellant transfer. Mm. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the tower catch stuff to me is just. It, it, it would be mind-boggling to see, but it, it still seems a little way off, you know. Um, you know how I did it in Kerbal Space Program, right? <laughs> how did you do that? I I, I, uh, I built a tower and uh, I launched from it, and then I played the video in reverse. <laughs> Perfect. That makes sense. <laughs> That's easy. That they way. should try that. Yeah. So first, build a time machine. Yeah. And then, yeah. All right, Marcus, do you have any final thoughts? Um. Yeah. Look, I mean, the, the I I think. Overall, everybody is very hell-bent on saying this is a success or this is a failure. I I don't like to look at it that way. I think that it was obviously both at the same time. It was absolutely spectacular, as we expect from SpaceX, because, I mean, they they build with this iterative design, you know, know, mentality all the time, and they've done so for a long, you know. I think a lot of people that follow this now that like to be quite critical of it, they probably weren't really sitting through the Falcon 9 development stage. They were throwing boosters around, exploding them all over the place. This is what makes them hugely exciting and entertaining to watch. It's why, you know, we we make a lot of the content we do. And, yeah, I, I think it's important not to get too critical about the fact that it is iterative. But, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, it would be nice to see it fly perfectly <laughs> and... Uh, you know, with any luck, they'll have nailed down this separation system, which I think probably in reality caused a lot of the issues that we're talking about in this flight. And uh, if they can do the next one flawlessly and splash that booster down on target, then they're probably going to look at trying to catch it, um, whether it will be the flight after or, you know, several flights after that. But, you know, they have to kind of get moving for Starlink reasons as well. Um, and this is where a lot of the uh, a lot of the costs is hopefully going to be absorbed by the Starlink project and things, which is getting quite significant now. Um, and really, there's no other competition that's even close to Starlink. So, yeah, I, I think to a degree, a lot of it comes down to being able to fund this thing continually. Well, Marcus, Scott, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Uh, this was a lot of fun to kind of do this catch up. And you guys notice all these details that I miss, which was great. And so now I'm caught up and I'll be able to incorporate this into my reporting into the future. But uh, hopefully we'll come back again one no more, maybe one more round when they successfully uh, check more things off of their uh, their checklist. Thanks, guys. But if yeah. they fail, bring Fingers us back crossed. anyway, right? <laughs> right, of course. Success yeah, or yeah. fail, yeah, I'll yeah. be here. Wait, as long as we're entertained. Exactly. That's, yeah, well, as long as we're entertained, we'll continue to, have to talk about it. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Exactly right. Cool, no worries. Catch you soon. Thank you. Fly safe. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Scott and Marcus. It's always super fun to let them just go at it and I get to get back and just come along for the ride. Now, I'm going to talk a little just a bit more about sort of my feelings about this launch. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Chilblin, Monso, George, David Giltonad, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. When we posted Space Bites this week, and I talked about the launch of SpaceX Starship, I described it as a success, that the rocket took off, that it completed several of its major objectives. Yes, it exploded, but, you know, that's how you learn how to do things, you test things. And it was interesting to me how many people in the comments were quite 
negative, quite angry, quite dismissive of the accomplishments that have been made so far. And, you know, I think it's it's possible to have a very nuanced view about the way this works, that there were problems that happened with the first launch that they were looking to fix, and I believe, you know, they really fixed those. Yes, the Super Heavy exploded. Yes, Starship veered off course and it had to be detonated. Would have been better if both of those had fully completed their mission. And yet at the same time, like anyone who's worked on a project, on a technical project, that you go through these iterative stages. And as Scott and Marcus said, like we watched all of the parts of the original SpaceX development of the Falcon 9 and just how many problems there were, how many rockets exploded, how many challenges they had to get this whole system going. But now it works like clockwork. And the hope is like, like having a fully reusable two-stage rocket system will dramatically lower the price for getting payloads into orbit. And you know, for all the payloads that you don't like, uh, but there are payloads that are really important. Think about really sensitive, very large satellites designed to monitor the Earth's atmosphere, designed to track climate change, uh, better ways of communicating here on Earth. Like there's a lot of uh, big missions going to other worlds. Like we could get a flagship mission to Neptune. And so there's a lot of reasons why you want a fully reusable two-stage rocket. So we don't have to throw rockets away anymore. And whether SpaceX is the group that does it, or whether they provide the inspiration and then some other group is able to finalize and, and demonstrate it over the long term and be able to make this work. This is what the future must be. We need fully reusable rockets and not ones that we throw away. So this is a step along the journey and congratulations to the thousands of talented engineers at SpaceX that were able to pull this together. Amazing work and I look forward to the next test. All right, we'll see you next time.